Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. My guest today has been called America's greatest living crime writer. In his L.A. Quartet and many other novels, James Elroy has painted a uniquely dark portrait of the city of angels, a nightmare world of psychotic killers, corrupt cops, and depraved appetites. Elroy writes of what he knows. His own mother was murdered when he was a child. And is that simple, terrible fact the key to understanding all the words he's ever written? James Elroy, welcome to Hard Talk. Hey, boss, what's shaking? <laughs> we are going to talk about 35 years of novel writing. And every one of your books has been set in and around Los Angeles. Absolutely untrue. Right off the bat, bam, I've wrote three novels. Uh -huh. The Underworld USA Trilogy, American Tabloid, which was Time Magazine's Novel of the Year in 1995, The Cold 6000, and Bloods Are Over set outside of L.A. Right, but Southern California is your world. Well, I'm from there, and it's where I go when women divorce me. <laughs> I suppose what I'm getting at is whether you've ever been tempted to go far outside your own sort of background, milieu, where you're from and what you know. Or is I that where you have to place your fiction? No, I have, but I came back. I made a conscious decision with my new novel, Perfidia, to craft a second L.A. quartet taking characters from the initial L.A. Quartet, The Black Dahlia, The Big Nowhere, L.A. Confidential, and L.A. Jazz, set in L.A. between oh. 1946 and 1958, and the aforementioned Underworld USA Trilogy, three novels set in America at large between 58 and 72. Characters from those two bodies of work and place them in Los Angeles during World War II as significantly younger people. So I made quite the conscious decision to go back to L.A. Going back is something I want to do with you, too, as we talk about the evolution of your fiction, because it seems to me, and you've talked about it a great deal, that you can't discuss James Elroy's body of work without spending a little bit of time talking about the long-running impact of that terrible period in your life, which began with your parents' breakup, mm -hmm. marriage failure, and ended uh, when you were 10 years old with the murder of your mother, her body found on an L.A. street. Um, the, the actual impact of my mother's death reached cessation, first abatement, then cessation, years ago. It's a fact. It'll always be brought up by the media, and properly so. And it's the key to understanding the work that I do. But it's not the key to me as an individual now, and hasn't been for decades. On June. Well, that's an interesting distinction, so if you don't mind, tell me yeah. why it's the key to understanding so much of the work. On June 22nd, 1958, when I was 10 years old, my parents were divorced, my mother was murdered. It was a sex murder. It was in a crummy uh, dog town east of Los Angeles called El Monte. A man raped her and strangled her unsolved to this day. Parenthetically, I wrote a memoir about it, My Dark Places. I went out with a brilliant retired sheriff's homicide detective, tried to solve the crime unsuccessfully. Hence, it's my autobiography and my mother's biography. Put that aside, my mother's death engendered a tremendous curiosity for all things criminal and historical in me. I got hipped on L.A.'s social history, then America's social history, L.A.'s criminal, America's criminal history, and its history from the point of that transcendence to now mm. that drives me. That makes it sound almost detached and like a series of conscious decisions you took to pursue a, a, a writing interest after this terrible mm -hmm. event as you grew up. But you've also suggested that there was something much more sort of visceral in your reaction to it. I mean, you've talked about the degree to which at the time you hated your mother. Right. And also, and this may sound perverse to some, Lusted. I mean, there was a sexual element there too, somewhere, which which Good also played out. Tall, red-haired, forty-three-year-old woman. Here's a newsflash to our British viewers at all: young males are introduced to the idea of female sexuality within the home, and their mother is the first archetype. This is basic Freud, and with me, it went a little bit beyond the basic. 
up until a certain point, you trot a red-haired woman, tall and statuesque, in front of me, and I'm way off the deep end. But we grow up over time. And I grew up over time in relationship to my mother's murder. In the wake of her death, it wasn't a conscious decision, but I made an internal decision to be happy, to be fulfilled. It's instinctively who I am. I'm but you weren't for an awful long time. No, I was always happy. That's really? the when yes. you when you yes. were into booze, when you were into all sorts of different crime, you spent time in jail, you yeah. lived rough for quite a while, you were happy? I was happy. You know why? I'm easily distracted, I'm easily obsessed. Give me a window to look into. Give me a movie to watch. Give me access to a public library and a book to read. <laughs> and so way back when, some kind of mind-altering chemical and I can find joy and fixation within myself. And it wasn't until I got sober as a young man at 29 and started writing books mm -hmm. that I went beyond this kind of idiot happiness into a productive sober life. See, just to talk about one of the books, and, and people across the world will know this one well, I'm sure many will have read it, Black Dahlia. That took a real-life case in L.A. It wasn't mm -hmm. your mum's case, right. but it wasn't entirely dissimilar. It was perhaps, just in terms of the detail of the murder, an even more horrible it was. murder of a young woman in L.A. Your uh, book was fascinating, but to me what's interesting about it is that it seems a l in the detective in that novel, there seems to be quite a lot of you. And yet, at the same time, I'm wondering, as you were growing up and you were making sense of what had happened to you as a kid, whether you really identified more with detectives or with criminals. I've always identified with detectives. I've always identified with police officers. I am a natural born authoritarian. I would rather live in a society that errs on the side of authoritarianism than in a society that errs on the side of permissiveness. I take myself and I superimpose my own loves, my own losses, my own sorrows, and my own yearning, which is the chief thing. I write in my memoir, The Hilliker Curse, that yearning is the chief fount of my inspiration. I yearn for women. I yearn for history itself. I yearn for big lives juxtaposed against large geopolitical events. And to return to your question, yes, I take these authoritarian characters, rogue in nature, and I give them a great murder case. I give them a dead woman to fall in love with. It's the Laura syndrome. Otto Preminger's 1944 movie, Dana Andrews and Jean Tierney, the lonely haunted detective falls in love mm. with the portrait of the dead woman and she turns up alive. Not surprisingly, I have just been commissioned by 20th Century Fox to write the remake of Laura. It's but, all connected. All right, but when you say to me you are a natural born authoritarian, that raises questions in my mind. Because if you're an authoritarian, you surely have to believe that authority works for the public good. That in essence, the police, the authority, the security uh -huh. services represent good, yeah. and the villains represent evil. Yeah. Uh -huh. I do believe that. Do you? But your yeah. books are so much more ambiguous and ambivalent than that. Your books are surely with a message that says, actually, the law enforcers can be, and are, corrupt. They can be deeply flawed. They can be almost as, as problematic morally as the wrongdoers. I take those characters who are problematic, I juxtapose them against Evil that is pervasive, it's in the outer world, they must interdict and suppress it. I am on their side as far as their interdictive and suppressive methods go. They are not meant to represent American law enforcement at large. They are always rogue elements. Yeah, you can't be on their side at times. I mean, you know, you some of the most uh, famous portrayals of corrupt cops in literature come from you, from yes. L.A. Confidential, yes. for example. Yes. And, and I love them anyway. They're my guys. How can you love them? I These love guys them. are absolutely abusive. They are unaccountable. I give you their souls. I give you their heartbreak. 
I give you the society at large. I give you malefactors who are 40 times as flawed and out on missions of systematic evil, and my guys quash them. But if you are prepared to tolerate the corruption inside the public bodies that govern our lives, it's a recipe for societies going rotten, going very, very bad. If it takes hitting a child molester with a phone book in order to secure his conviction yeah, and ultimate imprisonment or one-way ticket to the gas chamber, then I'm on the side of the guys who wield the phone book. Are you? Yeah. See, and devil take the hindmost. Well, you know what? I'm rewriting my my assumptions about your work as we speak, because I was going to quote to you the, the, the words of a, of a very traditional British crime writer, P.D. James, and I was expecting you to contradict them, but maybe you won't, because she said the classic detective story affirms our belief that we live in a rational and generally benevolent universe. I thought you would say, pah, that's nonsense. No, but no, uh -uh. no, I agree. Do you? James, yes. Yeah. Because so much of... I think human beings are evolving. God isn't through with us yet. So much of modern crime writing, though, and, and a lot of it owes a lot to you, you know, in, in, in its noir sort of feel, so much of it is about ambiguity, is about, as Ian Rankin says, you know, writing fiction where good doesn't always triumph, where evil, evil can't always be rationalized, and the reader is sometimes invited to take sides with the assassin against the powers that be. That's never the case with me. I am an advocate of moral fiction. You always know who my good guys are and women. So you do believe in good guys? You I know. believe in good guys, and I think the heroes of my books are in fact the good guys. They are the guys in first person or third person mm. subjective viewpoints and you have access to their thoughts. You understand them, you understand their rationales. Each and every one of them, the four characters, Kayla Kade Oshida and William H. Parker and even the evil Irish cop Dudley Smith, they Dudley are Dudley Smith who says, I control people and if I can't control them, I destroy them. He is on a slow, tortuous path to redemption. Wow. He is on a slow, tortuous path to self-sacrifice, salvation, and redemption. Even as we speak, See, in my brain. In your brain. Maybe the conversation we're having and the, 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 the explanation you give for ultimately for the sympathy you have for the cops who even you know are very bent very corrupt maybe that's one reason why uh, some people in the United States have come to see you as a, as a defender of uh, for example um, the LAPD even during the Rodney King fallout when the I videotape am, beating I of, of a black a citizen I, seemed so many so egregious I, and you said you know what give the LAPD a break if you see the entire three minute sequence of events pertaining to Rodney King you will not judge the LAPD anywhere near as harshly the extracted 56 blows to the head are shocking in that abbreviated context but that abbreviated context is nothing but a lie. You have to see all the events, the preceding two and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. you, you say you think like I a am, detective. By the way, the, I am, by the way, the yearly MC of the LAPD's Jack Webb Awards. Oh, I know that. You're yeah. close to the LAPD. I'm you, close. You've openly said a lot of my good friends are inside the LAPD. Yeah. I just wonder, even today, with all of the allegations we still see from human rights groups and others about racism, institutionalized abuse within the LAPD, mm -hmm. whether you're blind to it because you're just too close to no, them. No, no. What I'm not blind to is the idiocy of these human rights groups and their impacted, stiff-necked, sense of victimization. This is James Elroy who earlier in his career I think gloried in the idea that you were a demon dog who would 
say it like it really is in American culture, even despite the forces of liberalism and PC. De demon dog. I love dogs. <laughs> I love bull breed dogs. I love band dogs. Yeah, I'm but dogs can, that dogs can be dangerous. I'm sh and shocked that pit bulls are banned in a climate of hysteria in Great Britain. I stand up for Staffordshire bulls, the British dog that I've had three of, the bull yeah, terrier. Well, let's not get too hung up on dogs, but let's apply this a little bit to American culture today and, and the political atmosphere. In no, we're not going to talk about politics in America today. No. Well, I, I don't nah. mean party politics, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. I just mean the flavor of the times. For example, in your latest book, Perfidia. Hey, finally, we get to it. Well, it's an important book. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting book because you place it around the time of the Pearl Harbor attack and soon mm -hmm. after. And what you portray is a Southern California, which is in the grip of a fear of mm -hmm. a fifth column of a quote unquote enemy right. within. And because of that fear, corners are cut. The Constitution is sort of mm -hmm. uh, adapted, shall we right. say, to ensure right. that, for example, 100,000 Japanese Americans can be locked up, can be right. interned uh -huh. in camps. I just wonder whether you see a parallel today with I see America no parallel post 9 11. Today. No, I see no parallel today. Let's cut right through that right now. I write my books mm. in a state of immersion. As far as I'm concerned, Franklin D. Roosevelt's the president of the United States. Oh, but come on. Now, you, I know, you, no, no, uh, no. Brother, no, you hold on. I know he's not, but that's the world that I live in. It's 1941. There are no corollaries to any event preceding or following December 1941. That book is written in blood and in real time. The bombs fall on Pearl Harbor, 80 pages in. Then we're through, around uh -huh. the clock, up to the 29th. Abrogation of civil liberties. We know it happened. It was the Japanese internment, and it was wrong. And I say that it was wrong. And we're inside the perspective of a closeted homosexual Japanese American police chemist. He knows it's wrong. The other cops, even Dudley Smith, the corrupt cop, will come to view it as wrong because people in my books are always on a tortured road to self-knowledge. But even if you say you wrote this book in the mindset of 1942 and you refuse to move that mindset to today, you as you know, an important literary voice in America today surely have a view as to whether there is a justification post 9-11 for things like the Patriot Act that we saw in the Bush administration or indeed the mass surveillance. No, that I don't. No? No, I do not. Because it I do you? not, it does not interest Why me. Doesn't it and interest I you? do not acknowledge anything outside the history that I write about. And it is that very quality, the fact that I deny the world today, do not use a cell phone, have never logged onto a computer in my life that give these books their power, and that gives these books their immediacy and the feeling that they were written in that time period. Mm. That's it. I'm here, I will, I'm 66 years old, I will die in 34 years, slightly after my 100th birthday, but I will have a lot of books that will stand, and they will stand because they were written in history's fire. Will you, in the course of the next 34 years that I'm sure we both hope you have, will you turn your mind to events that go beyond the period of the United States in the 30s and 40s, which has been the focus of your attention so much no. of the time? Will you will address a what has happened no. in the last 10 no. years or my, might happen in the next 10? My historical curiosity runs out in May of 1972 when my novel Bloods Are Over, my most recent novel preceding Perfidia, concludes with the death of J. Edgar Hoover. I'm going to write the second L.A. Quartet. I got three books to go. I'm going to write a post-war trilogy that will run concurrent in its time frame with the first L.A. Quartet. And brother, at that time, I will be old and I will be tired, and hopefully I'll have enough money in the bank to live the rest of my life.
Let me ask you about the genre, if that's the right. word you right. use. Uh, crime fiction, detective mm -hmm. fiction. You've been a pioneer, and I've mentioned people like Ian Rankin who say they owe a huge debt to you here in the UK. There's always been this discussion, and maybe it's based purely on snobbery within the sort of world of literature, as where, where the crime fiction should be allowed in to the sort of literary circle. Does that matter to you? No, no. I'm not a crime writer, nor am I a noir writer. I've written a bunch of books, celebrated books, set in LA, the crime noir yeah. epicenter, at the height of the film noir era. And so, noir has been applied to me. What I've been since The Black Dahlia is a historical novelist. That's a historical novel that's resting under your left hand mm -hmm. right now. And I'm happy to have influenced a generation of crime writers, and I think designation like crime writers, historical writers, all of this, it's interesting in the moment, and really in the end it only pertains to where your books are shelved. I suppose when people, I've been reading some criticism of you, and one thing that struck me, a lot of writers have compared you with perhaps surprising names, maybe surprising to me, I mean James Joyce, just for your use of language, inventive use of language, stream of consciousness at times, others have compared you to Conrad, and I think Dennis Lahaney said, the Conrad comparison works because you explore the savagery at the heart of man. Is that right? Do you think we are, have a savage heart as a species? I think we are. I think we have a savage heart mitigated by conscience. And I think the very best of us come to spiritual flashpoints points of explication in our personal lives where we see ourselves in the context of the world, of other human beings. I believe that we are all as one human beings. We are one soul united under God. I believe as William Butler Yeats did in The Spiritus Mundi, the collective unconscious. And in that sense, maybe I'm as one with guys like James Joyce and Joseph Conrad, who frankly I've never read, or <laughs> Dostoevsky, who I've never read. But put all of that aside, I don't think of this stuff. What do I think of? I wasn't fighting you or baiting you just to fight your bait you when I was talking about history versus mm. the contemporary. That's where I live. I live in history. I live in yearning. I've always been that way. If I'm not yearning for some woman, I'm yearning for history itself. I'm yearning for the conjunction of men and women within history. Are you yearning as much now as you ever did? We talked at the beginning about yeah. the murder of your mom, about what a difficult childhood you had, and I could understand the yearning that came from that, but still today in your 60s, you're yearning I'm not yearning for a woman I could, because I'm deeply in love. I'm, with a British woman who lives there in London. But that sense of yearning that has driven you on. Yeah, it still drives me. It still drives me. Yeah, that's, that's why the demon dog analogy is so good. Yeah, that's why I love pit bulls. It's why I'm, <laughs> why I'm chagrined that they're banned here in Britain. And why you're still barking. I bark, yeah, I bark, I bay. Yeah, my girlfriend and I are going to Dartmoor on Friday. And I'm going to go search the Hound of the Baskervilles, and he's going to come up to me, and we're going to talk, <laughs> and he's going to go, Elroy, what's taking you so long? <laughs> James, James Elroy, thanks for being on our talk. All right. God bless you, man. Thank you very yeah. much.